So what's it like to fly faster than the speed of sound? I feel the need, the need for speed. Hello everybody, welcome to another episode of Mondays with Mover. I am Mover C.W. Lemoyne, author of the Spectre series and the Alex Shepard series. Uh, on today's episode, short episode, just thought I'd talk about uh, one of the most frequently asked questions I get, which is, uh, what is it like to fly supersonic? What is it like to fly faster than the speed of sound? Is it an adrenaline rush? Is it some kind of, you know, a magical event? You know, do you see plaid or is it just uh, something you look down, notice and go? So uh, first, you know, kind of talking about the theory behind it, you know, supersonic is based off of your Mach number. So Mach 1 being uh, 1.0 times the speed of sound. Uh, and then most airliners fly at 0.76 to 0.83, depending on what you're flying. So that's uh, 0.7 times the speed of sound. So 75% or so of the speed of sound. Uh, and that's based on your, your altitude. I don't want to get into the, the theory on that, but that's indicated Mach number. So most fighters are very well capable of going supersonic. Uh, the T-38 even, you know, it, it, it's able to go uh, over the Mach. And the first time I ever went supersonic was inadvertently in a T-38. I did an aileron roll and afterburner and ended up uh, supersonic at 15,000 feet. So that was kind of my first time. Didn't do it on purpose, but kind of what happened. So learned that lesson. But... Um, uh, as far as the F-18 goes, I do have a, a video here I wanted to share with you. Uh, fastest I've ever been is like 1.45 or so, uh, which is right around 900-ish uh, knots uh, across the ground, ground speed, uh, just based on the winds at the time. But as you can see in this video, the uh, the Hornet, you know, it, it, it's, it's a non-event. So you start off accelerating an afterburner level flight, and it starts to push through that transonic regime in that 0.95, and then once it gets through that drag, because the drag starts to build up at that point, uh, once it pushes through the number over Mach 1, it starts to accelerate uh, even faster. Um, and that's it. Nothing. There's nothing. You, you look around and stuff. A lot of people mistake the uh, transonic, which is where you get the, the big the shock cone that you see maybe the Blue Angels do on the Snake Pass and stuff. They, they confuse that with being supersonic, but it's not. Certain surfaces are going supersonic, but the aircraft it's, itself is not going supersonic when you see that. So, you know, at air shows, they're not actually supersonic on those Snake Passes. Uh, but you know, at altitude, as you can see, it's, it's kind of a non-event. You know, you just... You look down and you're like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm going supersonic. You know, here 1.2, 1.4. Uh, there's no real difference between, you know, 0.9 and 1.4 as far as what the jet's doing. I mean, it's it's obviously less maneuverable. You don't have as much control authority because you know you're going so fast. Your turn radius is going to be bigger, but um, you know it's not anything that you really notice. So. Uh, it's cool to tell the chicks at the bar, but not necessarily uh, something all that good. I mean, we would go supersonic on air-to-air -air sorties, you know, just about every time over the water. Now, on the F-16 side, <clears throat> fastest I've ever gone, uh, 1.86 uh, at 800 knots. And eight, the reason it was 800 knots is 800 knots uh, was a, around the, uh, the aircraft limit. And I kind of did that wrong. I was a new lieutenant. And the, in Navy, you know, in the video I just showed you, that was a 1v0, so I went out doing advanced handling characteristics and just practicing by myself. In the Air Force, that was a very rare occurrence. You rarely, very rarely went out by yourself. So I ended up um, having one of those stories. I was like, well, let me see how fast I can go because who doesn't want to you know, say, hey, I want Mach 2, which is what the Viper could do. And I went up to altitude, started a supersonic climb uh, about 1.0, up to 50,000 feet and then started a descent. And what I didn't know is you don't want a full descent, you know, because obviously the Mach number changes with altitude. The lower you go, the higher the indicated number has to be. So what happened is I started the descent from 50,000 feet and ended up at 800 knots, the speed limit of the aircraft, the indicated speed limit before uh, I passed, uh, I was at 1.86. So that was the fastest I went, which was cool because when I checked out of the airspace, uh, Miami Center Controller, she called me up and she's like, uh, hey, uh, uh, Mako 11, uh, I've got a question. I'm like, oh, go ahead. I go, well, how, how fast were you just going? I said, I'm Mach 1.86, ma'am. And she goes, wow, that looks so cool. Because my ground speed was something like 1,100 knots. It was something ridiculous because I had, you know, 150 knot tailwind because I was going west to east. 
uh, in the airspace in the winter time. So it was pretty cool. Uh, as you can see on the uh, the Hornet one, at 1 1.4, it was about 950, 960 across the ground. Uh, the ground speed's the one with the G. But uh, yeah, it's cool to say. It's cool for bragging rights. But as far as adrenaline rush or anything like that, you really just don't notice. You know, you look down, you can see the you know the the, the pitot-static system will kind of jump as you cross the number. But there's really nothing. Um, other than looking at the gauges that tells you that the wind noise doesn't really change the aircraft you know there's nothing there's, it's not vibrating there's no buffeting or anything like that these aircraft are made to go supersonic so there's no real indication of that comparing it to you know what would be an adrenaline rush to me 500 knots 200 feet like the video I showed before you know low altitude flying is more of an adrenaline rush because you get that sensation of speed you get that you know the trees uh, you see the ground moving beneath you you, you kind of see that at altitude there's nothing to reference it against so there's really no way to tell you know that you're going that fast other than by looking at your gauges so uh, but you know it does happen fairly often and you know it's really cool to, to be able to talk about All right, today's edition of the Mover Mailbag, I thought I would uh, read an email or a message I got on Facebook uh, on Friday. And to me, this is probably one of my favorites so far. Um, it comes from Phil, and Phil writes, Mover, we spoke a while ago when I was still in ROTC, and after I found out, I was DQ'd from pilot. That's disqualified. Uh, your Make Them Tell You No article has been in the back of my nugget since, and I found out today that I got selected for UPT, which is undergraduate pilot training, after fighting to get the waivers I needed. Thanks for being the dude that tells a story that a lot of people need to hear. Uh, Phil, that's awesome. I mean, that's, that's, that's incredible. And that, you know, when I first started this vlog, I had no idea that this would turn into, you know, somewhat of some advice on for younger folks on how to become a fighter pilot. But I'm glad it has, and I'm glad... Being able to tell my story and tell Gonky's story has been able to motivate uh, people who thought they didn't have a chance to go out and, and, and get their dreams. Because, you know, the, the make them tell you no, I mean, it's a catchy phrase and everything, but it, it's the truth. You know, I, I'm going to interview other fighter pilots this year, and you'll hear the same story over and over. No one's story is, well, I wanted to be a fighter pilot, I became a fighter pilot, and everything went great. Everybody's got some level of adversity that they have to overcome. Uh, the, the key factor and the thing that, that is persistent throughout all these stories is the fact that they didn't give up, that they made, made someone tell them no. And if you do that, and if you don't self-eliminate yourself, so if you let, let the process play out and make someone in a position of authority tell you no, not a recruiter or anything like that, but actually go try to get the waivers and stuff and keep pushing, eventually you'll be like Phil and accomplish your dreams. So. Uh, I hope that Phil's story helps, I hope my story helps, I hope anybody's story uh, that's on the channel helps to, to let people know that you can do it and you just have to be persistent and just keep trying. You know, that's, that's what separates you know, fighter pilots from the rest of the world is that they, you know, they don't just take no for an answer, they'll, they'll keep pushing. So if you have anything for the mover mailbag or any comments, suggestions, whatever, uh, you can reach me, C.W. Lemoyne at cwlemoyne.com. Uh, my Facebook page, C.W. Lemoyne, or uh, Twitter or Instagram. I try to answer as many questions as I can. I do get a lot of questions every day, so uh, if I haven't answered your question, I'm sorry. Uh, sometimes I won't answer the question if it's been covered in one of the videos uh, and I just don't have the chance to, to personally get to it, but uh, I try to do the best I can. So I uh, hope you've enjoyed uh, today's Mover Mailbag. Thanks for watching.